coming up, Matt Dolphin continues his look at the PCW show. I play some games. I chat to Jeff. And end with a typing. Let's get on then. I'm at Kensington Olympia, a place that seems to be in a perpetual state of reconstruction. Why am I here? For another look back at the Personal Computer World Show, and it seems congratulations are in order. Yes, it's 1987, and the PCW show is 10 years old. In the last decade, it's become the largest event of its kind in the UK, with attendance figures usually defying expectations. The show is sponsored by Personal Computer World magazine, and has been since the beginning. The show was organised by the Montgomery Group, which was formed in 1895 in order to promote building trades. The 1987 show is divided into a three-floor business section in Olympia 2, compared to two floors in 1986. The National Hall and Upper Gallery contain leisure, home computing and more business. All in all, there are said to be 300 exhibitor stands. Is Olympia running out of room? The show guide features a competition in the style of Channel 4's Treasure Hunt. The first person to solve the clues will win £1,000. The clues are so cryptic that I'm wondering if Kenneth Kendall wrote them himself. For Spectrum fans, everyone you've ever heard of is here. There are software houses, from Activision to US Gold. There is hardware from the likes of Cheetah or Trojan products. And not forgetting those vital publishers, such as Newsfield, Dennis Publishing or EMAP. By this time I had a Spectrum Plus 2, which meant I was interested in products that took advantage of the new features, like better music or bigger playing areas. Many publications of the time previewed the show. In Crash Magazine, there's excitement about numerous software houses, including Piranha, who will be celebrating their first birthday. There's also a rumour that Amstrad will be making an announcement about their newly launched Spectrum Plus 3. Sadly, it's not possible to visit 1987. So let me bring you the next best thing, a virtual tour. Using my historical hoard of freebies, it's just like being there. But a word of warning before we get started. Looking back, 1987 was a peak period for controversial advertising, with promoters using more and more daring shock tactics to sell their games. And while this approach was used to hide the shortcomings of some of the actual products, there were some that were worthy of the hype. Let's begin our tour. It's Saturday the 26th of September and I'm here with my brother and some friends. This time I have a pretty good idea what to expect, but there are no parents in tow, which means no emergency spending money. As I step through the entrance, I see that Amstrad have once again bagged the best positioning, with one slight change from last year. Sinclair and Amstrad are mixed together, instead of on opposite sides of a walkway. The big draw for Specky fans is the new Spectrum Plus 3, which looks great in its black colour, very slick and Sinclair-like, and has benefited from a 20% price drop just before the show. The Plus 3 finally gives users a disk drive, but is it the one I always wanted? Honestly, no. For some reason, Amstrad have used a non-standard 3-inch format, I've already seen them put non-standard joystick connections on my Plus 2, so now I'm on my guard and I can see that they've done it again. I won't be buying a Plus 3, but I do pick up a couple of glossy brochures. Regaining my composure, I go and get the show guide, but there's a big shock on the front cover. A 100% price increase from last year, that's half the price of a budget game, though I do like the colour picture on the front. Rockfort products are showing the Disciple, marketed as the ultimate disc printed joystick and network controller for the Spectrum. At over £80, it even lets computers talk to each other. Designed by Miles Gordon Technology, it's being sold in a variety of disc drive packages to suit most budgets. Next I visit Elite Systems, who have secured a number of licenses, including Buggy Boy and Thundercats, a game that will be on my Christmas list. Mastertronic have secured the Sega Master System rights in the UK. They've splashed out on a colour advert in the guide. Nobody's cooking dinner, Dad's back from work, and so excited that he hasn't even got changed. I pick up the games catalogue which has Outrun and Space Harrier, two of my favourites. Plus, there's a light phaser and 3D glasses. Will this flashy system be enough to tear me away from my Spectrum? Will I be able to persuade my parents that I need one? Unlikely. So instead, I buy Plexar for £1.99. I move on to Borland International, and that means only one thing. To my horror, I realise I've taken a wrong turn into the business hall. It's time to get back to the leisure hall, and quick! 
I make my way up the nearest staircase, but maybe it's been a blessing. Moving up to Olympia 2 level 1 and still in the business section, I find something that stirs excitement. I've just seen the Scion Organizer 2 and I want one, but I don't know why. It must be the spiritual connection to Scion's early Spectrum software, like the Horizons tape that was bundled with my 48K. This is a pocket calculator worthy of craft work. A device that should have Don't Panic printed on the front in large friendly letters. An all-in-one organizer that lets you practice your basic programming. Despite not having a built-in Horus game, it's a tempting package. Scion seem to think so too, and they've managed to get their advert on the back of the guide. Back to the leisure hall, and Telecomsoft have had a change of heart this year. In 1986, the Firebird and Rainbird stools were on different floors. Were they not on speaking terms? But they seem to have patched things up this year, with the Rainbird having its wings clipped so that it stays with its older sibling. The A3 flyer shows that Specky users have some sophisticated titles to choose from. There's further evidence of reconciliation in the Firebird magazine. The whole telecom soft range is here, along with competitions, features and information about the people behind the scenes. I collect a copy of the magazine and I purchase Eyeball 2. Next door I find Gremlin Graphics and there's great interest in Jack the Nipper 2 coconut capers. My brother manages to get what I can only describe as a dangly plastic nipper, though I miss this one myself. Onwards to US Gold, who are promoting OutRun, 720 Degrees and a game based on the new laser tag craze. They've also changed their carrier bag design, so I make sure to get one. Ocean have a large two-storey stand to promote forthcoming arcade conversions. They also brought more of those lovely silver bags, perhaps left over from last year. Under the Imagine label, they are promoting some titles by Spanish software house Dynamic, complete with some very intriguing artwork. Houston have made up for not being at the show in 1986. They are handing out A4 posters of their fantastic artworks for the likes of Zynapse and Exelon. Nice colour variation. Other products include Evening Star, Magnetron and Nebulous. It's time to head upstairs to the gallery level. I begin by visiting Newsfield, who are launching their new magazine, The Games Machine. Crash is there too, and I purchase three binders for all my back issues. Moving along the gallery, Palace Software are promoting Barbarian, a task that Maria Whitaker and Wolf from Gladiators are more than ready for, albeit in full-size cardboard cutout form. And no, those cardboard cutouts are not for sale. I check this very carefully. Mattel have brought Laser Tag to the UK. I've read about this premium toy in the games machine, and I can't wait to see it, and pick up some glossy brochures and a badge. Mattel are quick to point out that lasers can't actually be seen, but they are pretty relaxed about flying children. I now genuinely think this will happen, and bad news for those of you who want a star belt, some poor rep has had to go through all the flyers today and cross them out. What's that low humming noise? It must be the powerhouse. They already have a reputation for poor budget games, but they've really gone for it this time. They are promoting the notorious Soft and Cuddly, complete with posters and actual sick bags. We already know about this game, having read the crash review just before the show. It only scored 55%, but do we care? Naturally, we all buy a copy. Back downstairs, we're just about to leave when we notice something special. Uncle Clive has made a new computer. As he sold his name to Alan Sugar, he's rebranded as Cambridge Computer and produced the portable Z88. We all spend ages on it, loving the keyboard and the display. I feel very happy to see Uncle Clive rising like a phoenix. He's also got great positioning near the entrance, though there is something ironic about being adjacent to Amstrad. And so, we end our virtual tour. Crash Magazine quoted attendance at more than 75,000 up on the previous year, and good positioning at the show did wonders for emerging companies. In his book, Hints and Tips for Video Game Pioneers, Andrew Hewson recalled how a simple demo of Nebulous was all it took to reel in that critical publicity from the press. 1987 would see the show held at Olympia for the last time, but the show would go on, as we'll discover next time. This is Buccaneer, released by Firebird Software in 1985. My first thought on this game, looking at the inlay and screenshots, was that it was a River Raid variant moving sideways instead of vertically, but I was wrong. The instructions are vague, shoot the aliens, avoid the mutiles, which are heat seeking missiles, and get to the docking sequence to repair damage and refuel. Later it promised meteors and rotor droids that cannot be destroyed and have to be avoided. On to the game then, well where to start? Only the top and bottom of the screen scrolls, giving a fake scroll if you like.
aliens are difficult to identify really, they're just random shapes that somebody's thought up and you shoot them. This game uses the mechanic, which I find really annoying, of when you fire, you can only fire one shot at a time and you can't fire again until you either hit something or your first shot hits the edge of the screen at the far right, which means sometimes you have to wait for a long time. Luckily the aliens don't seem to want to crash into you kamikaze style, they just wander about, but you still have to be careful. They do fire shots at you, but these are usually easy to avoid. Randomly a mutile appears, accompanied by a sound effect. This just heads straight for you, and you have to hit it with several shots before you destroy it. Each new level brings a different alien, and the game progresses in much the same fashion. Shoot, avoid, next level. There is a fuel gauge, so the idea is you have to get rid of the aliens as fast as possible to avoid running out. I found the game interesting at first, but it soon became a bit monotonous. I wanted to see this docking sequence, so I had to keep on playing, and eventually it arrived. Here you guide your buccaneer into a hovering, uh, thing, and you do have to be pixel perfect. Once I'd seen that, I didn't feel the urge to keep going, but then I forgot about the rotor droids and meteors. I didn't get any of those, instead I got a missile attack, and here you get randomly placed missiles scrolling across the screen, and you can't shoot them. You have to avoid them, which can be tricky. I just stuck to the bottom of the screen and made it through. As the game progresses, the aliens fire more, so it does get tricky. I can see how this could become a high score challenge with friends, but I suspect a better game would turn up very soon that was much better. This is Ninja Massacre, released by Codemasters in 1989. This game was also part of the Codemasters CD pack. The game doesn't have any sort of story, and only limited instructions. That's probably because it bears more than a passing resemblance to the arcade game Gauntlet. You enter a maze, you shoot things, destroy generators that spawn enemies, find keys to open doors, get food to keep your health up, and, well, we all know how to play Gauntlet. There are 50 levels to get through, but not much variation in scenery. You do get different enemies, and also destructible walls, so you have to keep an eye out. Level 1 is fairly straightforward. Get a key, open the doors, move to a place where you can kill oncoming enemy, destroy the generators, or in this game they're called traps, but anyway, and then exit to the next level. There are two ways to play the game. You can try and get a high score by killing everything, or you can try and get to as many levels as possible by finding the exit as soon as possible. Unlike the arcade, there's no constant scrolling. It's more of a push scroll, so when you reach the edge of the screen, it moves. This can be dangerous though, as there are enemies just a few blocks away, and they suddenly appear. On the third level you are presented with a room full of walls, and you have to blast your way through them, find the key, and get out. No heroics here, this is a very time critical level. Due to the, I'm assuming, flashing lava or something that keeps on spreading throughout the level, you need to get in and out as fast as you can. At first I thought the movement of the sprites were character based, but if you look closely I think they move every 2 or 4 pixels rather than 8, but this does make it easier to line up shots. Throughout there's a decent tune playing which can be switched off if it gets annoying, but I didn't find it so after playing for about 30 minutes. There are also sounds for various things like firing and hits. The music only plays on 1 to 8 key machines. Control is good and overall the game plays well, and it's not a bad version of the arcade game. Level 4 gives us a bit of a colour change with blue floors. It's handy to have a level map handy if you are serious about getting anywhere and trying to go the route of getting to the next level but I played without it. One thing you need to keep an eye out for is magic spells. And when triggered, these will destroy everything visible on screen, which is very handy, particularly in level three. <laughs> oh, 
I enjoyed the game. It felt good, it wasn't too unfair, and I felt like I wanted to go back and try again. You do get level codes every five levels, so you can start at the level you last played. That's a good idea, as playing through all of the previous levels could be a bit dull if you just wanted to try a different challenge. One thing I missed is the voice telling you that your health is low. I often got killed because I was concentrating on fighting and getting keys rather than my health. But then again, you can always use a poke. Overall then, a decent version and well worth playing if you like gauntlet style games. So today I believe we have a question from a YouTube viewer and his question was why don't you do a best game of and do it year by year. So we thought that was a good idea so we're starting with 1982 and I was very surprised when I found out the number and quality of some of the games from 82. There were some good ones. There are a lot of arcade clubs. There are, that's really to be expected. You've got Invaders and Pac-Man clones and Frogger clones. Everybody's wanted to play arcade games when they got the computer. Yeah, but in that list, there are some really, really good games. Well, look, I'll stick with Invaders to start with, because Invaders from Active Computing is a 1982 game, and for me, I think it's one of the best ones. It's got four different um, options in there, and very good. Very smooth graphics, unlike the majority of them, where they're just character-based. Yeah, I've only played it a few times, but it is good. Yeah, like moving on from Invaders, you know, we've got lots of other things to talk about. Manic Miner? Manic Miner, was that 82? No. <laughs> Cut that bit out. No, I think that's Manic funny. I think that's, I think that's funny. <laughs> One great game that was released in 1982 was, of course, Football Manager. Um, Define great. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I know people that like it, but yes. Loads of people are a fan of Football Manager. There are. I'm not saying that people don't like it. It's just not my cup of tea. But I can see how it would have caught on. Yeah, a lot of people played it. Lots and lots. Another similar game, one of those kind of stats management games uh, from 82, was one called Great Britain Limited that I really like. We right. had to run the country and try and get re-elected. Okay, fair enough. I know, I know you like those sort of things. I do. Um, I'm going to throw in 3D tanks. Do you happen to like 3D tanks? I do like I do like 3D tanks. I think it's a very innovative game. It uses a lot of different mechanics, barrels going up and down and all sorts. But I don't think it's my favourite. Or probably it's not even in my top three favourites, I think. I don't think. Oh, this will be good then. What are your top three favourites then? Okay, so my top three favourites, and I was amazed at some of these. Timegate from Quicksilver. Yeah, Timegate's another one that you... You've said before that you really love. I've never played it. I, I really should go and play Time Gate. Um, Penetrator from Melbourne House. I ca I couldn't believe that Penetrator was 1982, but it is. A great game, Scramble Clone, and even got a level designer built in. It has. The, the wave, was it firing missiles or bombs where you had to tap forward slowly? Yeah. yeah Once, that, that, well yeah. not slowly, you just had to tap forward would fire it. I think that was so they could use joystick with one button. Right. Yeah, that, that is, I, I don't mind that actually. I, I, once you get used to it, it's fine. I can, I can play quite, probably through to the final level on that. Yeah. That was the only thing. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna criticize Penetrator, it's the fact that you, you that firing mechanism. It's obvious why they did it. Although if you're playing with the joystick, it must have been really annoying. <laughs> yes. Uh, and of course, the big one then, I probably my. I wouldn't say it's a game I keep playing, but I'm going to give it my top slot out of merit and how it changed the face of software, particularly adventures, and I think that gives it away. And that's The Hobbit, also from Melbourne House. I was going to say, Melbourne House were having a good year in 82, weren't they? I think they were, yeah. I mean, that The Hobbit had characters that did their own thing. They, they had graphics that was unseen at the time. And a, a parser that actually worked. You could type in full sentences. So for, for 1982, that's a, just an amazing standout game. It is, yeah. Still is a classic. People still play to this day, I'm sure. I, I've, I've never completed it. <laughs> I have. I don't think I completed it back in the day. So what, what have you got? What games have you got in your top three or whatever? Football Manager. Yeah. 
Well, I'm looking at a different list to you, so I'm looking at the Spectrum Games Bible and the list they have on there. Okay. And other than the ones you've already said, they're in your top three. Football Manager is the only real one that stands out. Okay. There were some other interesting games. Escape was in there. Yeah, 3D Escape. Yeah. Um, I, I I thought the Sinclair ones weren't too bad. Planetoids and Space Raiders. They weren't they weren't shabby at all. No, they're not too bad. Cyber Rats, which I remember playing when I was a kid, which was a centipede clone. I haven't played it for years and years and years, but I did I did get some enjoyment out of that. But yeah, and Arcadia's in there, but I don't like Arcadia because it's flickery and the yeah, I, I wouldn't say it was the the best shooter, but, but again, in those days, early days, everything was character based, and Arcadia wasn't. So you know, you have to give it some points for that. I think of the list I've got, you used a longer list than me. You've already taken the best ones. So oh, three, I, I do apologize. 3D Tank Penetrator and the <laughs> Hobbit. So, so I'm stuck with Football football Manager, which was great. Great Britain Limited is an honourable mention, I think. Yeah. But there weren't a lot of games. It was very, very early in the Spectrum's life. And due to problems with supply from Sinclair, not a lot of people had it. Mm, but then yeah. you move into... 83 and the number of games just explodes so next time we do this with 83 we're going to have a, a bit of a problem on our hands that's going to be a massive massive job but anyway we'll get round to that but anyway thank thank goodness nobody mentioned horace This is Specky Soccer, released in 2023 by Vauxhall Tower. If you liked football games back in the day, you will probably remember a certain title called Sensible Soccer. Looking at the loading screen and intro screen of this game, you will see some hints at what it is. After a nice tune, we get into the game. And here you can pick teams, change colours, change the formations and players before the match begins. This view will be familiar to soccer playing fans everywhere. The player you control is circled and well, it's football, or for US viewers, soccer. Get the ball, pass it and try to score. The control is good and very responsive, but if I'm being honest here, I don't like football games and I'm not very good at them, but that doesn't take anything away from this game. The style, movement, sound and graphics are really well done, and it's a great achievement for the Spectrum. This is not a free game, but the price is low enough if you're a soccer fan. You can, if you really want to be the person that doesn't want to encourage software for this great machine, opt not to pay. But I paid. I want the authors to know they have been supported, and hopefully they will continue to produce great games. Definitely worth getting if you like games such as Sensible Soccer or Kickoff. This is Slapdab, released by Anirog Software in 1983. A fast-moving comical game involving skill and strategy, so the inlay claims. You control Sam, the little painter man, who has to paint large areas with only a small paint pot. Because of this, he has to keep going back to the larger pot to refill. As he paints, he disturbs woodworms, who chase him, but they can only move into the areas that have been painted. Ok, so it's not an original game, but it's not too bad really. You move around, filling in the screen as you go, and when you run out it's back to the pot. Eventually you will disturb those woodworms, and they then just home in on your position. You can often, if you are clever, paint an area that can trap them, which allows you to get to the paint pot easier. However, as you fill more of the screen in, this becomes harder, especially if you get caught and die, as sometimes you can generate right next to the paint pot where there's a woodworm sat. 
and its instant death. The graphics are 8 pixel user definable graphics and moving character squares. Control works fine and sound uses the early standard machine code effects found in many games. As the levels go on, there are more and more woodworms to avoid, so eventually the game will become impossible by design. It's not a bad 16k game, but it's all been done before many times. Diamond Digger appeared in Popular Computing Weekly in November 1983 and was written by Jin Proven. The double page listing amounts to about one and a half pages of typing, so it was no easy job. Once I typed it in, there were a lot of problems to iron out. Initially the grid was not drawn on the right hand side properly, and then half the grid was not drawn at all, and then the graphics glitched when you moved left or right. Level 2 was partially broken and you couldn't collect diamonds. Level 4 was totally broken and many more smaller problems. Eventually though, we can play it. You have to move your shovel around the grid, collecting diamonds. Randomly, an alien will drop down, freezing you in position. And if it hits you, you lose a life. There are multiple levels to the game, so it does offer a challenge. There's a bonus level in between levels, where you drop the shovel down the right column to get the diamond. The game plays a tune throughout as well, which is an interesting thing for a type-in. And there are a few other tunes as well. Obviously being basic, the graphics move in character squares, and the sound is just the standard beeper. However, it's not a bad game at all, and very colourful. This is the first time it's been seen in over 40 years, and will be available to download from my website shortly. Thank you.